Hi guys, it's John Armstrong here from John Armstrong Photography. Uh, thanks so much for watching my videos, I really appreciate it. Thank you for the comments um, that I've received from the videos and thank you for subscribing, I really appreciate it. In the next uh, few weeks I'm going to be changing the way I do things. I've met up with uh, some videographers who are going to team up with me and they're going to handle all the video content while I work on uh, the actual subject matter and what I'm going to be talking about. Hopefully do more tutorials live out there doing shoots, hopefully stuff that can really benefit you guys. Um, okay, today's video I'm going to have two segments. I'm going to be doing a bit on off-camera flash and flash in general with the Fuji system, which we know is a, a little bit of a, a tough one. Um, and then show you some shots and what I did on a recent shoot using Fuji alone. Uh, as of the 1st of February, uh, shoots going forward are all going to be on Fuji gear. I've made that decision. Um, so yeah, so I had a run with it through the end of last year where they gave me a lot of gear. I tried out different, uh, different lenses, to, uh, obviously used two bodies on the shoot and um, I really, really enjoyed it. But I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I know you guys, a lot of you guys out there are battling with flash and using Fuji. Now, it all depends on which way you're going to go. If you're going to be just using on-camera flash, and uh, you are needing ETTL, there are a couple of options. You've got your, um, your native flash, which is, I think it's the EF42, and they also have an option, this one here, it's called the Nissan R40 flash, and also op offers you uh, TTL. No, uh, the one thing that the R40 also offers you, which is really good, is full manual, obviously, but it can actually offer you high-speed sync. Okay, so the way you do that is that you actually engage not the power button the actual uh, the button that you would test the flash with if you hold it down for a few seconds next to the dial which has ttl and manual and so on uh, it's going to flash or change color i can't remember which one it is i don't have actually batteries in this at the moment but you'll see it change and once that happens only in full manual can you then engage high speed sync and it only works between a hundredth of a second and four thousandth of a second uh, with your fuji camera so just remember that high speed sync only works with full manual flash between a hundredth of a second, I have no idea what, what the hundredth is all about, and the uh, four thousandth of a second. Well, and you can take your, your flashes off camera to a certain degree using um, either a cable or a wireless trigger. Now the cable option uh, really is, you can only really use the Canon uh, TTL or ETTL cable, and that's purely because there's a five pin configuration which matches the Fuji flashes. And with the cable, it's really just taking information from one point to another. There's no protocol involved. So it's, uh, you know, quite happily sits on the Fuji camera and all the TTL, TTL information gets transferred through the cable into um, e any of the TTL flashes that Fuji offer, including the Nissan R40. And um, there are ways of extending it. I know you can get uh, cables that are like 33 feet long. Uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. So I know some guys can cut the cable and you know do a workaround where they were able to extend the cable. There's a couple of websites I think out there that give a tutorial on how to do that and the correct ca cable to use, which I'm not a huge fan of. I think you know if you're going to go to the extreme of long cables, you might as well invest in uh, wireless triggers. Um, but there are a couple of brands. There's Velo. There's a lot of third party. You just got to look under Canon Canon um, TTL cables, and there's going to be a whole span of uh, options to choose from. The other, the, the, the wireless option, the trigger receiver, I actually uh, found out about this a couple of months ago. There's a, a company uh, out there producing a product called RoboShoot. Um, there's a couple of little variations of these triggers, but the top of the range one I think is called the MX20. And what this allows for is total TTL shooting with your Fuji camera and your Fuji flashes. Interestingly enough, the, 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 the designer of this has also allowed it to, to use um, uh, Nikon SB flashes, which I think is the SB 800 and 900. And uh, so it, it actually communicates TTL with those flashes. So if you've come from a Nikon um, system, uh, changed over to Fuji, you can use your flashes now with full TTL, which is quite amazing. Obviously, I haven't seen the results, so I don't know myself, and you should, you should check it out. Um, the one thing about sort of TTL shooting and uh, whether you've got on-camera flash or off-camera, either using the cable or a trigger uh, receiver, is that Fuji's software obviously uh, may not be really uh, conducive to uh, easy shooting when it comes to flash compensation. Obviously you've got your camera, your exposure compensation on the camera which affects your uh, ambient light 
but you really need um, quick access to flash compensation on camera. So you may, I don't know if it is possible, I think it is, I have to check, uh, where you need to set your flash compensation as one of the function buttons on the camera, which gives you quick access to it, because quite often TTL gets you into the ballpark, but you need to make adjustments by either lowering or raising your ambient uh, camera compensation, exposure comp compensation, and then make an adjustment to your flash compensation and it will be nice if it's easy, easily accessible through one of the function buttons. Um, this is really the reason why I don't do TTL. The only time I do TTL is when I have a camera, a uh, flash on the camera. Uh, if I go off, it never gives me what I want. I just go straight to using a light meter. Um, sometimes when I don't have a light meter, it's very quick. You just you dial in your ambient light, you get your background right, then you bring in your off-camera flash, you power it down until you're happy, and that's your uh, that's your shot. So um, there, those are options to look into, so maybe you guys find something decent there. But I am very excited about um, Fuji's uh, flash that they're releasing. I really want to see what that's all about. Okay, for off-camera flash, now going manual. Uh, you guys have, I'm sure, all heard of uh, Young Mu, I think it's called, and Godox, and there's a whole lot, like Cactus, there's a whole lot of brands. Now, I'm not really pushing any particular brand. I use Godox um, Speedlights, okay? Um, so, but really, it doesn't make a difference. Now, the one reason why I do use it is that they come with a lithium battery, not pen lights. I hate pen lights. I hate carrying around pen lights. These things last, you know, one flash I might change up, change up once a day, and another flash I might keep the battery the whole day. So it really is a, a it's nice to have a powerful battery in your flash that you don't have to worry about uh, power. And recycle times are improved because it is a very powerful battery. Okay, a couple of things to note on the Godox flashes. When I used Yung Yu in the past, Yung Yu, I think it's called, um, it's a great flash, but they didn't last long purely for the reasons that I, I hammer flashes. I'm, I, just, I just throw everything at them. I expect them to do everything for me. So with the Godox, it's got a, a, a heat um, warning on it. So if you're going to go at half power and full power continuously, this thing just very quickly shows you a thermometer on the side of it. Boom, flash just turns off and that's it. Can be a negative. But I've learned to shoot around it. I've learned that when I'm in full power, just, just take it easy, look for my shot, get it. Because if you bang, 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 you're not going to have a flash to use anymore. So just bear that in mind. When you're using Godox flashes like these, um, which is the 850 and the 860, that will happen and you won't have a flash. But you will have a flash that lasts a long time. Where the Lumiur didn't warn me, um, actually I, I can't speak for all of them. I had a model quite a long time ago, maybe the new ones are different. But that's the experience I had. Um, I use Magmod, okay, so I try travels like I do a lot of traveling for my photography. So I'm sure you guys have seen Magmod. It's a, a Kickstarter program that started, it's done very, very well. It's basically magnets that connect, uh, connect to your flash, uh, just rubberized that go over the flash. And um, once they're on the flash, then you can modify your light. So you can bring in uh, grids, you can bring in gels. And they literally just just stick to stick to the flash like that. So it's pretty straightforward. So in the shoot that I'm going to show you just now um, that I did, I uh, there's a couple of shots where I'm going to show you how I use these. So I have multiple flash setups. I'm bringing in ambient light with color in the background, but but using on camera flash to still light my subject up with a clean, more blue white light. So I get that balance, uh, and it works really really well. The, the other two magmod uh, modifiers that I really really like and use a lot. They can take a bit of power out of the flash and just bear that in mind. You gen tend to have to be a bit closer to your subject to use these things. This is the bounce. Now the bounce, um, it's not just an obvious bounce that you'd use like when you, when you lift your bounce on your flash, your white card. It's a bit more powerful than that. What it actually does, if you're doing portraits where you're nice and close to the subject, this basically just increases the size of your flashlight gives you a softer light in the face. So it's not just throwing uh, light up, it's also throwing a bigger space of light onto your subject. And the bigger the light source, obviously the softer your fall off. So that works really well in that regard. I also use it uh, um, when I want to cover a large group of people and I've, I've got enough power in my flash to be able to do that. This really gives me good spread. And that's literally just the, the flash up like that. And power into it, I do use a little bit of light out the back but it works it works really well it just spreads the light the other one is the um i forget the name of it actually sorry i'll put the information in the bottom 
um, sphere. It's called a sphere. That's what it's called. And that's, you know, you can go straight on flash onto someone's face. It really softens it up. Not that I'm a fan of that. You can bounce flash and give you general fill. But I use this for the off camera. So when this is off camera, this is on. And it just covers the subject nicely uh, using the, the zoom function on the flash. Going to 24 zoom, no, no longer than a 50 zoom on the flash because you've got to manually set your zooms on these. Um, that generally covers a two person setup or a one person setup quite well. Uh, also, medium close ups, you can zoom in a bit more, and your, and your assistant can step back. And so, quite often, if I don't want to take my big flashes, these get doubled up. And I just, I just make a, just here, I just made a, a flash stand here. You can see, I've just made a bracket, and literally the two of them go on. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty handy thing to do. Uh, it does increase the power twofold, and you probably find that those shots that you're trying to do on full power, trying to get your subject uh, well lit, now you're only having to do like on two quarter powers or two half powers. So the flashes don't overheat, and you're getting sufficient uh, power. So you could even be in 12 o'clock midday sun, you're getting your shadows here, you underexpose the shot so that you have no highlights on the face that are overblown. You've got deep shadows, and these flashes come in and foot it all, and it doesn't even look like the person was, um, or the person was under midday sun or had shadows in their face. So these can be quite powerful when used. If you want to go even more powerful, which I highly recommend because, um, quite frankly, speed lights are not always up to the task. You have to be a bit more creative. Uh, I've got the Godox Wistros, which are the 8180 and the 8360. Very powerful. The 360 is incredibly powerful. Um, there's two different versions now. They've got a second version after the 360, which is TTL with Canon cameras. So you've got to decide which trigger you're going to use, which I'll show you now as well, uh, how you would operate these. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about triggers in a second. But either way, whether you use the version 2 or version 1, it's a 300 watt second power rating on the 360, which and, and because it uses a battery pack and it's still quite a, a compact system, it is incredibly uh, powerful. Um, and there's quite a few modifiers you can put on it. I'm trying to still not carry modifiers. The whole point of going small with Fuji is that I wasn't going into beauty dishes and huge soft boxes. I'm going to be making, in the next couple of months, putting together ways I can actually uh, put the mag mod on you because it obviously it comes with a, a, um, with a dish on it. But I'm trying to modify this so that we can somehow get uh, these onto the head of the flash. And from there, I can then just really you know, bring the size of my whole travel setup down to very lightweight, very small um, carry bag. So, yeah, quite exciting now that I'm using Fuji cameras that I'm able to go really, really small. These batteries last very long. I've got two of them. I very seldom have to use a second one. I just have the second one as a backup. So it will last the whole wedding day if you guys are wedding shooters. And it's... Plenty, plenty power. Um, yeah, you know, if you've got the money, it's a slightly more expensive flash than the speed lights. It's actually, quite a bit more. At least three times more expensive. But um, it, it'll take a lot of the frustration out of speed light shooting uh, that some people battle with. Uh, so, I highly recommend that as well. Okay, so when it comes to triggers, Godox and Cactus and Yung Yung all have their triggers. Okay, uh, because you're using Fuji system, you're not using TTL. You're using full manual flash. Um, there's two types that the Godox offers. It's the basic one, it's called the FT16, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It's um, very simple, it just goes on your hot shoe. It's got the single uh, pin for trigger, so your camera still triggers the flash, but your camera has no communication with the flash. You are then using plus and minus, uh, and it also has a screen to tell you what your power on your flash is, and you're going from 1 16th power, 1 8th power, 1 quarter power, 1 half power, all written here, whatever's on here is the same as on your flash. So very easy communication. You just set your channel and you set your um, the number which they sit on. You've got your channel and you've got your grouping. Sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. You obviously decide which groups your flashes are in and these can operate multiple flashes. You know, there's, there's, there's uh, A to F on the one side and one to nine on the other. So you have tons of options. I don't think you'll ever need all of those for most setups. Um, now, when it comes to the speed lights, okay, the, the reason why I went for the 860 version of the Godox um, mostly, I do also have an 850, is because of the top, one of the triggers I use communicates directly through the pins. So even though I'm not using ETTL, I'm still communicating through the bottom of the flash um, with the power settings, and I'll explain why in a second. But the 850 doesn't 
uh, would, would be compatible with this basic trigger. And what it is, it's just a small little trigger. As long as your groupings are the same on the side as what you want it to be, you just click off the side of this flash here, like this. And boom, that's off. Okay. So just making sure that you're on the same group, the same channel, and these two work together. All right. Fantastic combination. Uh, very powerful. Um, and the lithium battery uh, just makes the whole setup very neat, very clean. Uh, when it comes to the other triggers, uh, I went and got the Godox X1C triggers. And by the way, what I'm telling you is not gospel. You know, take everything I say with a pinch of salt. There's many options with this. This is just what I use. But hopefully this can inspire you or give you an idea of what you want to do. Um, but certainly this is not, I'm not advocating this is the only way to go. But it has worked for me. All right, so you've got your X1C uh, trigger and you've got your um, receivers. Okay. What's really cool about these triggers, which I'll uh, put the information again at the bottom for you guys, is that they have a hot shoe on top of the trigger. Okay. So when I'm using the multiple setup with the magmod, putting filters in around the room where I'm throwing ambient light around with different colors, now I've still got my on-camera flash um, that uh, allows me to still fill my subject the way I want to. So it's basically allowing me to do anything I want in the background but still have control of the person in front of me in a situation where I'm not doing a off-camera flash setup, where I'm on a dance floor, where I've got a group of people. I'm throwing a beautiful pink light around the back of them. You can see it against the walls. And they look perfectly lit with a nice, um, nice balanced light, um, one that a flash without a filter would give you. So, and I'll show you again later with some of the images that I've got using these combinations. Now, the reason again why I got the 860 is the 860 communicates with this via the trigger, sorry, by the receiver, and the trigger not having to put the one on the side. Okay, so everything's done from your trigger on your camera, uh, and it communicates through the bottom of this into the camera where the 850 cannot do that because it's not an ETTL flash, even though you're not using the ETTL. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Uh, highly recommend these. Um, I really do worry about putting my, a heavy flash on top of the trigger when I'm um, shooting you know, on the camera. It really looks like these triggers take a lot of, lot of strain. So I normally use the smaller R40 or even my Canon old 430EX. Um, it's nice and light, and I put it in manual mode, and I'm firing off the top here, and it's much, much better. I just worry about the, this taking strain, so just be careful when you have an assistant, and you're using this combination like that. You know, if they just waving the, the pole around with your flash on, and they even connect anything, it doesn't take much for this just to rip your uh, receiver in half. So really, really take care or damage the actual hot shoe here. There are different uh, flash holders that are very, very good. There's, there's actually some of them that actually um, actually fit into the actual flash holder like that. So no weight goes on the hot shoe. And that might be something to consider. And that's something I'm considering uh, going forward because I've had a lot of flashes damaged that exact same way. So just to clarify, this is all manual control flash, um, not ETTL. Um, that's the way I shoot. Especially if you're doing multiple flash setups, you can't have ETTL because if you're throwing in a color or a flash from behind your, your, your subject, like on a dance floor first dance, multiple flashes, that affects the ETTL on the camera and it underexposes the image thinking more light is coming in. So you've really got to have total manual control to be able to be creative in, in the, the way you express the image and the way you want light to come through. So that's, uh, yeah. So again, just to highlight again, I use Godox, great product. Uh, the smaller 850 and 860 flashes I recommend, whether you want to go for this trigger or the original basic trigger is up to you. And the AD-118 and 360 are great flashes and I highly recommend them. Then as well as the MagMod system with the magnets, please be careful with hard drives that are not solid states in computers, um, small portable hard drives. I don't think we do too much damage if you put it near it, but if you're just going to go like that on the back of your computer that's spinning hard drive, you're going to have trouble because this is magnets, so it will damage anything like that. So just take care traveling, but I highly recommend these. They do take power out of the flash. So remember, when you start modifying these type of things, the flash has to come closer, or you have to really put on the power with multiple flashes. So these are the things to consider, but at the, at the expense of not having to travel heavy, 
uh, I highly recommend this. And then lastly, I um, just wanted to discuss neutral density filters. Um, I know many of you know what they are. For those of you who don't, um, there's a couple of uses for neutral density filters. One of them would be to reduce your shutter speed. So in daytime, uh, full bright light, you can actually get uh, blurred motion, waterfalls, street scenes. By just putting on a neutral density filter to, to a particular strength, you're able to slow your shutter speed right down uh, in the middle of the day. Um, the other option, which which is relating to what we're talking about here with, with uh, off-camera flash and flash in general, is that because you've got a sync speed of either 1 80th or 2 50th, depending on the which camera you're using, um, you know, in full bright uh, sunlight, uh, if you're using 200 ISO as your base ISO and you're shooting at one of those uh, top sync speeds, you're really looking at f16, f11, if you're lucky, f8 in sunlight outdoors. Uh, you can get into shade line, you can get it down to sort of 5.6, f8. But as, as a whole, I mean, those aren't really sufficient if you're trying to get shutter depth of field for your portrait. Obviously, not every situation requires that you have shutter depth of field, but a lot of the time it is beneficial to have it to give it you know that, that really unique portrait look. So what you need to do is look into neutral density filters. Now, I don't like carrying lots of neutral density filters, so I try and find a neutral density filter that suits a majority of my needs. It might not be uh, suitable for everything, um, but the majority of the, sh the, 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 the sort of um, situations that I find myself in. I personally, this is just a personal thing, I don't like variable filters. I think they're great for video and things like that. I think uh, you get mixed results when it comes to stills. Um, you know, there's a lot of reports of sort of that X big netting sort of shape that appears if you overextend the, the or sort of, you know, open it up or close it down too far. Uh, it doesn't have definite stops that you can sort of work out as you're going. I know there are some really top quality, expensive ones that produce good quality. But for me, I really prefer having a fixed neutral density filter where I know exactly what stops that I'm dealing with. Okay. Now, when it comes to choosing how many stops you need, uh, I have recommendations. Obviously, this is just my opinion, but I wouldn't, you know, get a neutral, especially if you're going to be carrying one neutral density filter, maximum two, uh, and using it for portraiture. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily, I would sort of keep between um, sort of a four stop neutral density with a maximum of six stops, and six is even pushing it, I'd probably look to work between four and five stops. Um, and the reason being is that if you were at f16, for example, and you wanted to get it down to 1.4 for shutter depth of field portraits, that's a full six stop range. Um, so if you were in a situation where you weren't getting f16, you actually were in, say, cloudy conditions, and you your exposure is telling you f8, if you put on a fixed six stop neutral density filter, you're gonna get down to 1.4 and your, your lens cannot open anymore, maybe just like a third of a stop more like to 1.2 depending on lens you're using, but then you have to start bumping up your ISO to compensate for the six stops. So then you're going from a 200 ISO to an 800 ISO if your exposure was sort of showing F8 to start with, which then is not really um, ideal um, you know, if you want a nice clean looking portrait shot in the middle of the day, you really want to be lowering your ISO as much as possible. So personally, I use a four stop and that sort of covers most of my needs. So at worst, I'm going F6, so from F16, that's F11, F8, F5, 6, um, F2.8. So even from, sorry, I uh, said that wrong. <laughs> it's F11, um, F8, F5, 6, F4. So at, at, at worst, in the brightest light, I'm still managing to get F4. Um, with a longer lens, I can still get shallow depth of field. And then in situations where I'm at F8 or 5.6, I'm not really having to bump my ISO to compensate for that. So I'd recommend around that four stop. And if you do get a six stop, for example, and you get a four stop, you can stack them and make 10 stops, which then allows you to do the other creative sort of effects that you, that, you know, a, a, a bigger stop neutral density filter would offer like like uh, waterfalls, um, water movement, blurred movement, blurred uh, traffic, sort of things like that that you can do in the middle of the day. It doesn't have to be done at night time or in low light situations. So quite a nice idea to stack them, uh, something to consider. And then lastly, I would get the biggest uh, filter you can. Uh, I think in the Fuji range, I've chosen to go with the 77 and that covers most of the lens. I think the 100 to 400 might be a 77. So at, at at worst, it fits on that lens directly. So I use a step up filter, I mean, sorry, step up um, um, ring, which allows me to, you know, 
put it, pretty much put it on any lens that I want. So I just get the correct step ups and then if it one filter will go across all my lens lenses in any condition. So try look for the biggest and get step ups. Uh, that'll be the most cost effective way. And then I uh, personally use Hoya for my fixed neutral densities. Um, and that's purely because it's a balance between great quality and price. It seems to get that strike that good balance. I've always used Hoya and other brands, but Hoya's always been a very reliable company. Uh, I don't see any major issues with their neutral density filters and image quality. And I think it's a good balance between price and uh, quality. I think you're looking between 80 and $120 for filters. And the range that you're looking at for that four, five, and six stops is the Pro ND 16, Pro ND 32, and Pro ND um, 64. I think if you want to go for a two-stop neutral density, it's a Pro ND 8. I might be mistaken. Just check in, just check it, check that out. Um, yeah. And then lastly, guys, just thanks so much again for subscribing and watching my videos. I have a part two that's connected to this video, so please look out for it. It's going over recent shoots that I did with uh, my Fuji gear. And a lot of what I've discussed now with Flash will be brought up um, in this video and obviously image examples as well. So thanks again, guys. Yes, please look out for that part two and have a great day. Cheers.